Let's see me get started. So, um, last time we introduced this kind of formula where we take an interval. bar times some function of x, and this was the same as e to the h bar, where I, I build a second order differential operator from the propagator, and I apply that to the same function. You evaluate at x equals zero. So for today's discussion, I realized uh, there's a, a slight generalization of this. And of course, this, this is just a nice way of rewriting the Feynman diagram expansion, because this second order differential operator is the thing that contracts edges in the graph. So applying this operator a bunch of times to the vertices, each of which has a copy of f, is building up the Feynman diagram. So a slight variation of this. What if I do this integral? Or in this function, I, uh, I evaluate at f, f of x plus y, and I'm integrating against x. So I'm left with some function of y. And the answer is, it's just the same thing, except I don't, I don't restrict to this variable being 0. So I apply this, this operator to this exponentiated function. I don't evaluate at any special point. Uh, and this is equal to some sum over graphs with external legs. Uh, exactly as before. And on the internal lines, we put the propagator. And on the external, we label the external legs by this variable y. Okay, so we're going to be using this today. So, of course, why this doesn't work. But I want to, the first thing, <clears throat> so I want to try to evaluate some simple path integrals, and we'll, see, we'll run into the phenomenon of, of uh, UV divergences. So now consider. Um, I'm going to have a my fundamental field will be a function on aura n. And I'll have the usual kinetic term. I plus I zero Q. So by what we just discussed, this is going to be sum over connected diagrams. with external lines. Um, with the factor of h bar to the number of loops, which is the first betting number. And then there'll be some, some, some amplitude for the graph, which will be a function of phi 0. So to figure out, to get a feeling for this, these expressions, let's just write down the first couple of terms. So, yeah. Uh, the automorphisms, I think I said last time, but maybe a different, slightly different situation. The automorphisms 
Are they allowed to move the external legs? Yes, they are. Um, and uh, like having that normalization of one over three factorial helps you get the right automorphism factors when they move the external legs. So we'll see. So. so let's compute. The first look at the h mark of the zero terms. The first one we find is this, where I haven't contracted any edges. So what's that? That's just going to be the thing I stuck in there in the first place. So this will be 1 over 3 factorial integral by 0 cubed. <coughs> because I haven't contracted anything. And you see the 1 over 3 factorial is the automorphism factor. And the next one So here, here I have two vertices. Here I have one vertex, so there's a, only a single integral. Because if we look in the interacting term, it involves an integral. So for every vertex, we're going to have an integral over space time, which is all n. So here I have one vertex, so it's one integral. Here, I'll have some automorphism factor. So we're going to have an integral, a double integral over x1, x2 in Rn. So the rules are going to be for each external line, I just put in phi 0 at either x1 or x2 depending on whether this external line is connected to the, that vertex or this vertex. So here I'll get phi 0 x1 squared, phi 0 x2 squared. And for the internal line, I'm going to put down, write down the propagator. And I'm going to have an automorphism factor. So how many automorphisms does this diagram have? There's, I can flip there, that's two. Flip there, that's another two. Flip there, so it's eight. Yeah? What's it maybe a number of loops minus one? Uh, well, there's a h bar in front of the log. Oh, sorry. Take shift. And of course, the propagator is uh, yeah. I'm terrible at remembering factors of pi. The propagator looks like this. Now, you can see, if you can, of course, continue writing these expressions, and you'll see that all of the integrals you'll write down, as long as you know, the dimension of your space is not too small, all of the integrals will converge. There won't be um, You know, it looks like the integrand has a pole when x1 is equal to x2, but actually it's still absolutely convergent over there. The reason being, if you think about, you know, to analyze the convergence, we might say, we might as well take these guys to be constant, because that's not going to, these things, these are smooth functions, they'll make things converge more, they can't make things converge less. So the worst case scenario is when they're constant. So to figure out the convergence of this, you want to think about um, the integral over of radius 1 over or 
the n minus 2 times the volume of the n minus 1 sphere. Um, and the volume of the n minus 1 sphere is big enough, to make, or small enough as always to 0 to make this converge. Because this is like So in a similar way, any diagram involving trees will give you something that's convergent when the points are close together. If you're in small dimensions, you might run into problems when the points are very far apart. Those are called I-O divergences. But we're not going to be too concerned with these I-O divergences. In big enough dimensions, when things are far, far enough apart, this is going to decay nicely. You know, to avoid the I-O divergences, it helps to assume that the functions you're putting in, this phi zero, decays rapidly at infinity. So let's move on, look at the one loop term. So the first two diagrams one encounters look like this. So this one is just a disaster. This is going to be the integral. Now there's one vertex because so there's one thing we're integrating over. Phi zero of x. This one is the propagator at when well at x minus x. So this term just makes no sense. Because you're evaluating something like 1 over the absolute value of, of x at 0. Well, then we can also look at the next term, and we'll find something that looks a little more sensible, but actually is divergent. And of course, there's some automorphism factors which you guys can figure out. So here, here we have two propagators. So we actually, that means we just take the square of the ordinary propagator. So that's going to be uh, minus x2 to 2n minus 4. So again, like following the same argument, like to analyze whether this is going to converge or, or diverge, we must use dimensional analysis, just like we did over there. So the UV divergences are what happens when these guys are close together. So we, we don't really care about the integral over x1 like plus x2. So you might as well just focus on the difference between them. And we can set these to be a constant, just to analyze singularities. So if we look at y equals x1 minus x2, we're looking at some kind of integral over 1 over y, 2n minus 4, dn y. And this is dimension n, this is dimension 4 minus 2n. Typically, this will be of negative dimension and therefore diverge. It'll look like some integral of, uh, by, by dimensional analysis, in the integral of or p or, and you want this whole thing to have dimension uh, uh, see this is 4 minus 2n plus n. You want this whole thing to have dimension um, 4 minus n. So this should be. 
get this kind of thing. So typically, this will diverge. OK, so so this leads us to our first. Um, so we've seen that UV divergences occur at one loop in like the very simplest Feynman diagrams. So we want to understand how to regularize them and to remove the singularities. So to do that, we're going to need to pick something called uh, some kind of regularization scheme. And there's a number of different choices. I see. Are there any questions? So what popular option is dimensional regularization. I kind of hate dimensional regularization. I think it's kind of silly to pretend that your space is of dimension n minus epsilon because, you know, you have a tensor with n components. It doesn't make sense to say it as n minus epsilon components. Uh, I, another issue with it is that this, this doesn't really make sense on arbitrary manifolds. And you often want to study quantum field theory on a general manifold. So another uh, way approach that I, I think is quite useful is um, point splitting. So all that would amount to here is you would look at this integral and you would say, Well, the problems occur when x1 is equal to x2. So let's only look at the integral over the, over the region where x1 and x2 are separated by a finite distance. So then we've introduced a regulating parameter, epsilon. And then you would study the epsilon to zero limit in the singular terms and subtract them off. So this has been studied. There's an, some nice work by Epstein and Laser in the 70s. Uh, and one disadvantage of this approach is that it doesn't, it's a bit tricky to make sense of like, tadpole diagrams like this. There's only one point. How do you split it? It's a bit difficult. It's kind of hard to be systematic about such things. But people, people do, but it's not. It's, that, that part of it always feels a little ad hoc. So what, what we're going to use is um, a method based on the heat kernel. So I, I like this because this has a nice physical interpretation. Um, I find it easy to work with. So here the idea is you write the propagator as an integral 
of a quantity called a heat kernel are And then we have a regularized propagator. To be the same thing where I just restrict the domain of integration. And it turns out that the heat kernel is a nice smooth function except at t equals zero. So that this, once I regularize this way by bounding below the domain of integration of t, um, so, so all Feynman diagrams, these have no singularities. Like the integrals we do to compute the weight of the Feynman diagram, these have no singularities when we use this propagator. And then we will study what happens when epsilon goes to zero and extracting, this, extracting the terms which are singular in epsilon. So to explain this, I need to tell you what kt is. It's a really fun object of mathematics and, uh, and physics. We have a manifold. This is the Laplacian. And I'm, I'm going to use the convention that the Laplacian has positive spectrum. The heat kernel, kt, xx prime. It's a function, smooth function, assuming M is compact. If M is not compact, then there's more than one heat kernel. But if M is compact, yeah. So I, I wasn't, but I was going to get to that point in a second. Yeah. It's a smooth function on M plus M, Let's say A heat kernel. Which satisfies dt plus del x. Uh, yes, it's the Hodge Laplacian acting on functions, but the one with the usual, I mean, the, it's the one that's dt star, so it's like with the convention, so it has positive defi definite. There's no eigenvalues are non-negative. So on flat space, uh, well, so, let's see. so on flat space, for n, there's a unique kt with nice asymptotic behavior. And it's given by the formula at x, x prime. Oh, I forgot to put the initial conditions. So this differential equation tells you the evolution in time. And the limit as t goes to 0 of kt x prime is a delta function at x equals x prime. So I'm, on a flat space, it looks like t to the minus n over 2, e to the minus x minus x prime squared over t, up to factors of pi. So if you look at this expression, you notice it has nice exponential decay. And the rate of decay is governed by t. Very pro. <laughs> Davide is not allowed to come to this course. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so what's the physical interpretation of this? This is something discovered in the 19th century. Oh, actually, let me come back to that in a minute. So if M is a compact manifold, then there exists unique heat kernel. And if M is not compact, well, you have to worry about boundary condition. There, if it's not compact, there exists a heat kernel, but it's not unique. Yeah, just because it's a differential equation, might have some different boundary conditions, and it's not so important. So, uh, we write down one more formula. You might ask, what is the heat kernel for the circle? Turns out the heat kernel for the circle has a very nice formula. With the coordinate theta, and theta plus 2 pi is theta, then the heat kernel, theta, theta prime, is t to the minus a half times the sum over the integers uh, e to the minus e to the minus theta prime plus two pi n so what, what have we done? We've taken the e kernel for the real line We've averaged it to make it periodic. That gives you the heat kernel, heat kernel for the circle. Similarly, the heat kernel for manifolds which have a covering space, which is flat space, are all obtained in this way. On the other hand, if you wanted to write down the heat kernel for like some random metric, you know, you have no chance. Okay, so, so I'm going to come back in a minute to the um, how to construct the propagator from the heat kernel. But first I want to explain um, the, the physical interpretation of the heat kernel. So we note that Um, there's a couple of them. Firstly, kt x x prime is equal to the probability distribution for a Brownian particle. which at t equals 0 is at x. So we start t equals 0, we put in a Brownian particle which is moving around by jiggling, and then after time t, it's going to be somewhere on the manifold with some probability, and this is the probability. So it's kind of fun to think about why that's the case. Like, why does a differential equation tell us it must be the probability for Brownian particle? Well, you should think about well, the probability amplitude, you know, the probability distribution for a Brownian particle, of course, satisfies a differential equation. It just tells you what's the, I have a Brownian particle there, what's the probability it's somewhere nearby after some small amount of time. And the probability is going to be uniform in that sphere. On flat space, on a curved manifold, it will be deformed. And you can convince yourself that the probability after a small amount of time is obtained by applying the Laplacian to the probability we had originally. Just because it, you know, if it was a lattice, 
you can imagine something over the second derivative in various directions. Um, second interpretation. This is an interpretation, you know, we are very familiar with. We can come into a cold room, we turn on a radiator. For some finite amount of time, what is the distribution of heat? It's given by the heat kernel. So, is equal to the, the heat at x prime if at p equals zero, we have a point source of heat. At, at x. Of course, this is kind of the same thing because heat is like particles moving around. Um, and the third one, okay, it, if we imagine allowing ourselves to analyt analytically continue, we could look over the heat equation and notice that if we stick an i in, it's the Schrodinger equation. So kit, x, x prime, is equal to the, the wave function for a quantum particle at uh, t equal to zero is at x. Okay, so three and these two guys are really the same because if we kind of quick rotate a quantum particle, we're supposed to, you know, kind of find a Brownian particle. This is the path integral interpretation of quantum mechanics. It's a randomly moving, uh, it's like a, a particle randomly moving on your manifold. Okay, any, any questions? Okay, so why, why can we get the propagator from the heat kernel? So let's think for a moment about a massive field theory. It makes life a little easier. If you consider, if our kinetic term is phi Laplacian plus m squared phi, then um, the propagator satisfies Laplacian on one variable plus m squared p x x prime is equal to a delta function. So I claim that, that we can write this guy as an integral of the heat kernel. So to check this, we're going to check that the differential equation holds. So we'll look at the Laplacian on one variable plus m squared times this integral. So we can bring this guy inside the integral. We get two terms, m squared, e to the minus m squared t, a t, x, x prime. And applying the Laplacian to the heat kernel takes up the factor of minus d by dt.
So now we integrate by parts. Um, and well, how does that work? We can move this over here at the price of a change sign and also at the price of introducing some boundary terms. So if we move this over there, we'll get, probably go to the other blackboard. Uh, m squared plus del t e to the minus m squared t a p. And then that's what we get from moving the del t to the other side. So then we're also going to get boundary terms plus the, there's a term for t equals zero. Um, when t is equal to zero, of course, this term becomes one. So you get the heat kernel zero. And when t is equal to infinity, this is exponential decay. So that doesn't count. So we get nothing. And this term, of course, cancels. And this term is equal to a delta function. Yep. Okay, any questions? So, okay, so you might ask, why, why do we want to use the ma massive particle? And the answer is that if you're in a field theory, if you're in a massless field theory, it's hard to write down In a mass, if you're in a massless field theory with some zero modes on a manifold, that really isn't a propagator anymore. Because you can't integrate out the massless modes, you can only integrate out the, uh, the massive piece. So you'll find, you, it's not possible to find something which will satisfy the analog of this equation with m is zero. Instead, you'll find, you will always pick up a boundary term, an infinity, which will be the projection onto the harmonic fields. The massless case, we find the Laplacian x times the integral k g x x prime is equal to the delta function x prime plus um, the harmonic representative of the delta function. So, so this is a bit of a kind of subtle point. So what we're going to do for a massless field theory is we say, well, we can't, we can't actually find a propagator which satisfies just this equation, which is the delta function. This thing here will be good enough. It's up to, it's, this is the thing. You know, if we just throw away the, the zero modes, this will be what we want. Now on ORN, even, on ORN things are okay even in the massless case because you can put boundary conditions to ensure there are no zero modes. On ORN it's easy to see that the integral of t minus n over 2 e to minus x minus x prime squared over t e t so just by, by dimensional analysis, this is like up to some factor, the propagator. I mean, this, by some simple dimensional analysis, every copy of t contributes a factor of the norm of x minus x prime, and a number of x minus x prime squared, and you know, there's one minus n over two copies of t.
Okay, so, so in what follows, I'm going to kind of ignore this subtle, this subtlety here and just say, like, my propagator will be defined to be this integral. So let's go back to the, like the phi cube theory on our end and see what writing things in terms of the heat kernel, kernel does for us. So, so this expression so it's going to be sum over connected graphs but what we're going to do is say the propagator is now an integral so for each graph we're going to introduce a parameter for each edge. And integral <clears throat> So I'm going to integrate over these, these parameters. And then there's some weight of the graph. In this case, kt1, kt2, where I put the heat kernel at time t, te on the edge e. And then one over the automorphism group of the graph. So I'm... I'm Putting it like this because there's a really beautiful interpretation of, 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 of this expansion. So when we have, um, if you remember, the heat kernel here tells you about the probability of a Brownian particle going from here to here in time t1. And here, we also have probabilities of Brownian particles going from there to there. These probabilities are, are, are given by integrals over the space of maps from this interval to the manifold. Because if you look at the whirl line of a Brownian particle, the amplitude of a Brownian particle is the integral, is a path integral over that world line. So this is the same thing as a sum over graphs. Gamma of an integral, integral of the space of metrics on the graph, And then, and then this weight, the amplitude of the Feynman diagram is now a path integral. Integral of the space of maps, gamma to my manifold, say 4n, of, of some kind of Lagrangian. So, so we really are summing over possibilities of particles colliding and uh, interacting with each other. I mean, complete, in a completely literal sense. Like in Euclidean signature, these are literally Brownian particles moving around. The only, very, the only strange thing is that each edge of the graph has its own time. This is called a proper time of a particle. So we're integrating over the proper time. So I think this picture is due to Feynman. 
Though I don't think he used the language of the heat kernel, but uh, so another another reason this picture is, is important is that this is exactly what happens in string theory. And this is the, the field theory limit of the way string theory presents you amplitudes. So let me briefly say about that in string theory. Well, here. So one thing to notice is that you know we're summing over graphs and integrating over the space of metrics. You can, if you want, think about the space of all graphs with a metric being connected. It has a bunch of components, but only finding only the only component is given by how many loops it has. So at each loop, the space of possible graphs is connected because I can contract some edges and expand off others. So at each loop, this is this can be rewritten as an integral over some compact space. And that's what happens in string theory. So we have sum of the genus integral of the moduli space. The moduli space of graphs is the moduli space, the moduli space of surfaces is the moduli space of conformal structures. Just like this is the space of metrics, then integral of the space of maps from, from the surface of the target manifold. That's exactly the same thing. And in some limit, it's expected that these this becomes this. Yeah. This one here. Uh, it's yes, it's quantum mechanics, um, but on this singular one manifold. Well, I'm working in, in, in Euclidean signature mostly, so then it would be a, it's more like a Brownian probability. But in, if we, we were to work in Lorentzian signature, there would be factors of i, which would make it a probability amplitude. So like the heat kernel itself is, is, a, is an amplitude for quantum mechanics. So. That, Uh, well, I don't. I think the best interpretation is to say that the contribution from each graph will be given by the amplitudes from some kind of a quantum field theory on this singular one-dimensional space, and. The, the contributions of the vertices. I mean, to, to say what to say what the theory that lives in the singular one-dimensional space is, I have to say, well, what happens over here, and what happens over here, because that's they're different. And that's that's you know, the vertices just tell me what happens. There. That's why string theory is nice because all the points are the same. Yeah. So, uh, could you comment on uh, how all this regularization works on general Lorentzian manifolds? Is it not just uh, uh, off the top of my head, I don't know much about the analytical issues of the heat kernel on a general Ronson manifold. Maybe, maybe the thing to do there would be to take this T to be imaginary, and then you're you're looking at literally. On the mechanics, but I'm not entirely sure. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I suppose you would replace like your manifold by a finite set of points, probably. 
and then like each edge goes to one point. Like the points would be, you know, you have some, the kinetic term gives you some matrix which you diagonalize, the, those, it gives you the endpoints. So then each edge goes to some point, but at the, like the vertices might mix different points, something like that. Okay. Uh, Okay, so how can we, this is, this is fun, so how can we, you know, concretely understand um, the singularities in payment diagrams? So let's, let's again look at this, this pi cube theory on RN, and let's, let's analyze what happens for the first couple of payment diagrams we found that were badly behaved. So, so um, So what does this diagram do? There's going to be some factor of t, which we want to integrate over. This will give me um, the integral over x in Rn, phi 0 of x, then the heat kernel at x, x. Now, if you remember the heat kernel, it only on flat space, it only depended on the difference between the two variables. But there was a prefactor d to the minus n over two. So to understand the actual amplitude, we're going to have to integrate over t. But I'm going to integrate over t equals epsilon to infinity by introducing a UV regulator at epsilon. Uh, we get So clearly dimension two is going to be badly behaved here. Um, so let's work, I mean, for the moment, let's take a dimension not two, or bigger than two. Um, So what we've done is we've we've seen that there's some uh, like when we perform the integral. Now now we have some some control over the singularities that appear. Whereas before we just said well we have to evaluate this function when x equals x prime and that just doesn't make sense. So. To, to deal with this, we will proceed by introducing a counter term, and this will be the counter term. So I'll, I'll start, I'll discuss more about that next time. This will be the counter term, and when n is equal to 2. When n is equal to 2, you note that um, this is like t minus 1 dt. It doesn't decay rapidly enough t equals infinity for the integral to converge. So we have to introduce an, an IOR cutoff and a UV cutoff. So when n equals 2, we're going to integrate from epsilon to L t minus 1 the integral x phi 0 x this will be something like log L minus log epsilon. And we will introduce this counter term here. Just the, just the one which depends on the UV cutoff.
So I, I, maybe for the mathematicians in the audience, this is not what's going on, it's not clear, but I'll be some more systematic about uh, what I mean by counter terms uh, next time. For now, I just want to write down a couple of integrals so we get a feel for things. So the next example, So this was an example we saw that gave us an divergent integral last time. But here, this is going to lead to an integral from t1 equals epsilon to infinity. Both t1 and t2 go from epsilon to infinity. x1, x2, phi 0 of x1. Phi zero of x two. Um, now we're going to plug in the heat kernel. T one to minus n over two. T two minus n over two. And then we're going to have this expression here. So this is a little complicated. Um, but what you can do, and what we'll discuss next time, well, you can notice that this, you know, as long as these t's are not too small, this integral converges, converges beautifully. Um, because of this We've replaced 1 over x1 minus x2 with some power by this Gaussian. What you can also notice is that if when I integrate over x1 minus x2, I'm doing a Gaussian integral. We know how to do Gaussian integrals. They're given by Feynman diagrams, by Wick's lemma. So this integral, as long as this, this factor here is small, can be expanded by using Wick's lemma. In that way, you'll find an expansion in terms of all of the singular terms will be some finite number of terms in the expansion given by Wick's lemma, plus something which converges nicely. And this way you can find out what is the singular part of this integral and what are the counter terms. So I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this next time. I suppose the main thing I wanted to ex explain today is like how, how to regularize to make things finite.